Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, technologists, designers, attendees, tech enthusiasts. Welcome to my talk, which is about diversity in design. So I'm going to be talking about various different visual design mediums within this talk and the diversity that we try and work into the products that we create. Uh, I'll be talking about illustration, photography, UX, and UI. And a lot of these are going to come from my own personal experiences from the companies that I've worked in, and some of it from the reading that I've done around this topic. Um, to some extent, this talk raises more questions than it does answer them, but those are always useful as well. Um, so I've always had a, a drive to include better diversity and inclusion within the work that I do, within the design work that I do. Being part of a marginalized group, I find it really important to strive for better diversity. So the tools that we create, they're never completely neutral, and their settings reflect the cultural bias of the technicians that calibrate them. I feel like this is really accurate, really, really true within, within the industry at the moment, the technology industry. Oh, and before I forget, actually, I'll, I'll cover the content warnings as well, just in case. So this talk will include things around misgendering, ableism, which is when uh, people that have um, impairments or disabilities are uh, marginalized, uh, racism, visual representations of transgender people, LGBTQIA representation, and some ageism. So if at any point you find any of these topics uncomfortable, I'd like to make sure that the room knows that you are welcome to, to leave at any point, and that is not something that you will be judged for. So yeah, I'm going to talk about the, the issues that I've had within my career advocating for these different things, these, 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 making sure that the, the people that aren't typically reflected within these tools that we can represent as marginalized people are reflected in them. And that we're not just relying on the pervasive, uh, most represented people within the tools to inform them. So a little bit about me first. Um, <laughs> I change my hair so regularly that if I had to change this illustration every time I change my hair color, I'd just be doing that as, as kind of a full-time job. Um, so I'm Errol, uh, pronounced Errol. I'm a designer. I've been a designer for 10 years now. Uh, lots of different job titles from UI designer, junior designer, uh, digital designer, UX designer, researcher, everything in between. I'm a non-binary person. I'm trans regardless of what people think I may look like. So that means that my, my gender is neither male nor female. It's somewhere in between. It flu it's fluid. I use they, them, their pronouns. And I use the title Mux instead of Mr. Mrs. Miss. I'm a queer person. I'm part of the LGBTQ plus community. I have an invisible disability illness. I have PTSD. And I'm a carer for uh, sick parents and children as well. I find it really important to include all these different things that we embody as people, uh, as well as our jobs. So we are all of these things as well as our roles. And these kinds of things can really inform the kinds of products that we create and make them a lot better. So that's why I find it really important to include them. So I'd like to make sure that people feel like there'll, there'll be a space for questions at the end of the talk. But also, if there's something that you would like to approach me with individually after the talk, I like to make sure that there's a safe space where you can ask the kinds of questions that you might not feel like you could typically ask within a larger format. So if there are a question about trans issues, if there are a question about non-binary, if there are questions about the different things that I've experienced through my career, please feel free to come up to me af afterwards. There are no questions that can't be answered compassionately. So where I work, I work for a company called Ushihidi. So we are a humanitarian tech company. We were created 10 years ago. We're 10 years old. And we created an open source data collection platform 
around the election violence that happened in Kenya in the 2007 elections. Since then, the tool that we created for, for that purpose has been used in lots of different ways. It's been used to help people when they've experienced natural disasters. So in the Nepal earthquakes, the platform was used to collect data to send helicopters to where people were struggling um, and facing you know, danger, real, real danger. Most recently, we've had people contact us around the cyclone Idai. We've helped people in Kerala, but we've also helped lots of other initiatives. So things to do with street harassment in Egypt and street harassment in the UK. Anything where people need to raise their voice and make themselves heard and make sure that they're looked after, we, we have this tool that, that we support them through. We've also got a tool called 104, which was created when there was a terrorist attack in Kenya in a mall, and we couldn't find our team, and we wanted to create a tool where we could aggregate and collect all the different responses of where people were. We found that people were phoning people around, text messaging, trying to get in contact with people that we weren't sure whether they were safe. We weren't sure whether they were still alive. We weren't sure whether they'd exited the, the mall that had, been, um, that had been attacked. So what we thought we would do is we went into the office on the Monday morning and said, let's build a tool that will help this. At the moment, we're also building uh, another tool which is about communities helping each other in everyday life, and then how they can also use that tool when a crisis hits. It's about community resilience. So one of the important things to talk about with the Shahidi, and again, if you've got questions about humanitarian tech and what it's like to work in a humanitarian tech space, again, questions afterwards, always happy to answer. But one of the most important things to say about Ushahidi is it was the first company that I felt like I could be truly open in. So I've been there for a little over a year and a half, and it was, yeah, the first company that I could uh, disclose my gender identity, ask to use my preferred pronouns and name, say that I was queer without feeling like I would be excluded from the company or in, in, under pressure or danger. So I'm going to dive into the, the meat of the talk around visual represent, representations in design. So I'm going to talk about some of the past companies that I worked for, as well as Ushahidi. So I worked for a company which developed parental tech. So this was software for parents to help manage their kids' screen time on devices. If you're a parent, you might have this, this challenge around devices and how often your kids might want to use them. Um, and this piece of work was an illustration that I created for a series of marketing pieces. And this was one of the very first companies where I was like, okay, I feel like with, with this product, with this company, I can really make a difference to representation. Families are so diverse and so needing, needing inclusion that I, here I can, I can think about different skin tones of families, different visual disabilities that I can represent. I can think about how to represent same-sex couples who are, who are families, who are parents, who have the same challenges as heterosexual families and parents. So what I did was I created around seven illustrations, and this brief for this illustration was a family doing a conga line. Simple brief, very fluffy, typical fluffy brief. So I was like, cool, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do lots of different skin tones, lots of different hairstyles, lots of different visible disabilities. So what we've got here is a, is, um, a family doing this conga line. We've got a, a little bit of a close-up here. So we've got an older person here with what we can see as some kind of hearing aid type device in their ear. We've also got somebody here on the right-hand side who is holding a, the, the cane that people who are deafblind typically hold. Uh, so, what I was really trying to get here was, it's easy, to some extent, with, with illustration. Our imaginations aren't limited by what we can take a photograph of. It's only limited by what we can imagine and draw and, and, and create. So I was like, great, yeah, I've, I've been really inclusive here. Um, this is going to go down really well. <laughs> so, uh, that illustration didn't get used. Uh, these ones did. So of all the different illustrations, we, these were the ones that got published. Um, what I'd like to talk about a little bit now is, is the awkward conversation that, that followed from, from that. 
So I could kind of guess, you know, maybe, maybe the illustration didn't get used because the content wasn't ready, maybe, maybe something else was going on. But really, I was, I was ready to have this conversation that I'd been quite afraid of having around why. What were the reasons why you didn't want to use that, that piece of illustration? And it was really, really difficult. So I think my first piece of, uh, of uh, advice to you all is that these conversations are scary. These conversations are difficult. Because what they're doing is unearthing the bias that we all have to some extent. And some of us more than others, some of us more unaware than others and not necessarily ready to have those conversations. And one of the other important things to impart is that even if you make a choice to start having those conversations and they don't necessarily go well the first time, you've started that first step to that conversation for yourself and for the other people. So that illustration didn't get used. It got put on the, the back burner. I do hope at some point they, they decide to use it. But what I was really pleased about, even though the conversation didn't go as well as it could have, uh, I was pleased that I opened up the door for the conversation because I was nervous about including different kinds of families and different, different kinds of um, parents within the, within the visual medium that I was producing for this company. So I was less afraid at that point, but still slightly nervous. One of the interesting things that came out of the, after this project was we did some demographic data. So one of, the, one of the initiatives that I took was like, OK, what, who are the families that are actually using our product? And it turns out that within this product, it was predominantly African-American families in the, in the US that were using this product. So with that information under my arm, I went back into the, the room to have a further conversation about how we represent families. And I was able to, to take this data in and say, we need to be representing more families of color within our marketing material. We did, and numbers went up. Great. <laughs> so. so I'm going to talk about photography a bit now. Uh, I'm going to talk about a project that I worked on with Ushihidi. So we were working on a project uh, where we were engaging with adolescent girls in East African countries and Central African countries. The project as a whole was engaging a lot of different people, but we were working in specific countries. And we were working with these girls that were at risk of HIV and AIDS infections. So a lot of the work that we were doing was on tooling and working with partner organizations, but we also had some remit to do some work where we created posters and put them up in the clinics so that the young girls could better use the technologies to raise the issues that they had around getting different access to medication or getting different um, viewpoints across to the, to the companies that were looking after them, the, the organizations that were looking after them. And there was a set of brand guidelines around, around how this was to be communicated visually. There are a few different options that I presented to my wider team. But I thought, what a great opportunity it is for me as a designer, and also the company that I work for, Ushihidi, and the wider consortium of people working on this, to start exploring what visual mediums would work well in these situations. So I did an option here, which included the illustration work and the brand work. It's, it's quite gendered in a... In a in a typical way, but I thought the photography elements would actually give me an opportunity to move away from that as well and do better representation. So some of the imagery that I started to use was the imagery that was actually provided by the, the project. And I kind of I looked at these photographs and thought, I'm not really sure personally about these photographs. Like, How well do they represent the demographic of the women that we are looking to impact in these clinics? So some of, it, some of these pieces of photography were from, from the company. Some of them were things that I sourced through stock photography sites. I thought, great, actually, I've got a resource within my company. I've got people that live in these countries that are connected to these organizations that are working with these girls. I can use them, I can ask them, I can, I can ask for feedback on, on these images. And the images that got used are actually quite different. 
I remember one of, the, one of the most awkward conversations I had with one of my colleagues very, very early on in my time in Oshihidi. So it was a, a conversation that I wasn't quite sure how to have yet around race and representation. And they said to me with this image uh, of the, the girls ooh, down the bottom, they said, please don't use the ones with the girls with the buckets. It's really not representative of the people that we are trying to reach. And I was like, that is a very awkward conversation for me to have, but I'm very grateful that I had it, because now I know that this isn't, this isn't going to work for me. And I didn't make the assumption that it, that it would. And one of the other things that I did when I was looking for pieces of photography that would work well within these, these places was I used Instagram. I used Instagram and Google image search. I said, what is Nairobi like? What is Kisumu like? You know, what are people wearing? What are people doing? What are people's lives like? And turns out it's really not that different to most places. One of the things that I'm particularly passionate about is being part of the LGBTQ plus community is how our representation is shown in visual media as well. So alongside this, this piece around how to compassionately represent race and ethnicity in photography, especially within stock photography, I took um, a project on myself where I went to stock photography sites, popular ones, to investigate what kind of images were coming up when you search for these kinds of terms. And I remember being incredibly nervous, typing in the search term trans person into this search bar. I was like, what, what am I going to get? I, I had no idea what actually I was, I was going to get. Uh, surprisingly, the first set of results were reasonably good, reasonably well representative. And the descriptions of the images were as well. So here we've got a couple of images of, uh, we've got one of a toilet symbol, which kind of has a split female male. We've got a pride flag. We've got um, two individuals, two transgender individuals. And the description of one of them is portrait of a female transgender with brown hair looking away. It's compassionate. It's actually really good. I was like, great. I don't have work to do here. I don't have advocacy to do. This, the stock photography sites are doing it well. But then I, I got a little bit further down in some of the results and some other pages, and I was like, ah, there is actually some work that needs to be done here. So what we've got here is we've got a few more pride flag symbols. And actually, you may or may not know that the trans, transgender flag isn't, this is the gay pride flag, the, the rainbow one, recently updated to include a, a black and a brown stripe in it as well to be more inclusive. But the transgender flag is actually a pale blue, a pale pink, and a white. So actually, I was thinking, oh, oh no, actually, if, if I was a company, if I was an organization that really wanted to use photography within the products and uh, services that I create for these people, and I want to be compassionate and representative of their community, this isn't the right flag to use, if I wanted to use a flag at all. And we've also got a couple of images here that are inaccurate. Uh, we've got some symbols in the top left-hand corner where, where some of them some of them are representative of same-sex couples, but also the, the, the one symbol that is the transgender symbol, or sometimes used as the transgender symbol, is mixed in with them. So again, if I didn't know, how would I know? Where's the support here? And there's a few images that make me personally uncomfortable. There's an image of which kind of symbolizes secrecy with a kind of shushing finger to the mouth. And we've got a few that, that sort of have this positioning of one body type with another body type. And everyone has to make their own judgments about their levels of comfort when they see images like this and how well they think it represents the, the kinds of things that you may need to represent in your products. But I ha take issue with the idea of secrecy around transgender issues, around LGBT issues, and the representation in them. And I also struggle with the really clear and obvious gender markers, like the um, female-coded underwear of a bra and underwear. 
And what I feel like it does to people that, again, might not have access to further information, is it further perpetuates this idea that the standard narrative is a woman looks like this, and a man looks like this, and a transgender person looks like this and this and this. There's all these cultural whispers that we have to sometimes fight against to get better representation within the media that we use and the media that we create. And this is especially important when you look at various different transgender people and non-binary people, and you realize the diversity that real, these real people have. So this is um, some of my most favorite uh, trans and non-binary people. We've got Buck Angel in the top left-hand corner there, who is a female-to-male porn star uh, in the sex industry. Uh, he's a man with a vagina. He calls himself a man with a vagina. He's an absolutely fantastic activist. He's really worth looking, looking up and, and investigating the work that he does. We've got a couple of non-binary non -binary people in the, the center, Courtney Act, and we've got Jack Monroe. Um, again, we've got another female-to-male uh, person in the top right, who's Aidan Dowling, who I think it was last year for the very first time on one of the men's health magazines was uh, actually pictured on the cover of Men's Health magazine. It was a huge, huge uh, achievement within the transgender community to be included within that very male-coded environment as a, as a transgender man. So yeah, non-binary people, trans people, lesbians, gay people, everyone is a human, and everyone is so diverse that you can't necessarily put them in this box of this is what a search result is. I've got some, some go-to places that I go to for stock photography, because I think that it's naive to say that we would never need to use it within the industries that we work in. I would advocate always that you take the time and effort to involve your community in your photography projects and your visual projects when you need to include them. But I personally love africanstockphoto.com, photoability.net, which is a great one for people with visible disabilities. If you want to start including people, and you should, uh, with visible disabilities in your imagery. This is my, my friend Joy. She lives with me in Bristol, in my city in, in the UK. And she was really fed up of not seeing herself represented in photography. So she actually created a project which was funded by a local tech incubator called TechSpark to start taking photos around the city in the incubation spaces that included herself and all the other people of color and all the other women and all the other people that are marginalized within the community. And that is a free resource. It's the one down the bottom, the techspark.co. It's a great free resource. But again, I'd like to advocate the use of your community within your photography. So we might look at an image from, this is from meetup.com, uh, one of their about pages. We might look at a piece of photography like this and think, oh, it's not maybe lit as well as, as some of the stock photography that we can find, or maybe it's not composed as, as elegantly as, as a, a studio piece of photography. But what it is, is authentic. This is actually, the London Pugs meetup, and it's exactly that, right? It's the London Pugs meetup, and there's diversity in there, and it's authentic diversity. And it tells you as a user, ah, this is exactly what I need and what I want. So yeah, advocate for always using your community within your photography. And one of the other good things that you can do is if you have access to your community, and I would always say that access to your community is a great resource in testing your design work, is if you have to use stock photography, ask your community. Say, is this representative of trans people? Is this representative of you as a community where you work, um, where you're, you want to represent people of color? Ask them. And I would also say that one of the trickier things around being a white person and not necessarily having much background information about how to be inclusive with different race and different ethnicities. 
asking questions and asking the community was the best resource that I could hope for. And one of the things that I learned was that I can look at a piece of photography of a person of color and think that that is representative of a particular country, but it might not be. There are so many different skin tones, hairstyles, dress styles, that unless you're careful and unless you include your community, you can misstep with. And it's always good to ask your community and say, hey, where you are, is this the predominant style? Asking questions is scary, though. But it becomes easier the more you do it. OK. So um, going on to UX, and uh, I find that UX gets really tricky when you start including it in how products make money. And a lot of the time, your products do need to make money, or they need to survive. And this is actually from a, a real workshop that I had with several colleagues where they suggested that the reason that one of our products wasn't working as well was because it needed to be feminized for the female market. Whew. Whew. It still, it still makes me mad. I kept this one just because, so I can get it out of a drawer every now and then, look at it, and then realize that things have gotten better since. So I remember when this came up and I had this conversation. It really centered around, at first, do we make it all pink? Go gosh. <laughs> no, we don't. We definitely don't make it all pink. Um, but having further conversations and really digging into this and really struggling to get over my initial anger around this statement, not that you always have to. You don't always have to get over your initial anger. The, the anger is powerful and drives you. Don't feel like it, you don't have a place for it within these, within these discussions. But really, when I got down to the, the issue with this, this team, it was about the product being t typically kind of cluttered, very, the UI being very busy, and it basically seeming like a product that you did work on. And this was supposed to be a product that you used every day, very sort of lifestyle focused that you should be able to dip in and out of. And really, when we managed to get around to the, the, real, the real issue that we actually needed to solve through, through doing better UX and UI, was that we needed to simplify the UI and make it easier to use. So definitely not feminizing. So I know these, these kinds of things we see a lot. And again, it, it moves into that space where I'm talking about how products and services get kind of really t tangled up with how they make money. So here we've got um, an image from the hashtag on Twitter, which is masculinity is so fragile that they need to gender everyday items. So we have some men's tea. We have chap, chapstick, like um, lip balm for men. Uh, some sunscreen that is for men only. Um, and then one of the most perplexing ones, which is the cotton swabs, you know, what you clean your ears with? Uh, well, I, uh, uh, but there are men's ultimate multi-tool, um, <laughs> which, is, which is absolutely bizarre. Um, and one of the ones that I find most fascinating are our tissues. So, so, so that we have um, specific tissues for men and then maybe for women, even though it, here it just says t tissues extra soft. And I find really confusing how men don't want extra soft tissues. Like, you're, usually you've got a cold and your nose is sore, so you want them to be extra soft regardless if you're a man or a woman or whichever in between you are. And I think it's important to laugh at these things. It's important to find the humor within them. But one of the important things to take away from these is how excluding these products can be. Say if you're a non-binary person, you're walking through the store and you're trying to choose tissues or cotton swabs to use on your body, which is a totally normal thing for most people to do. And you pick something up and you don't see yourself represented in it. Or you find that you're, you're specifically excluded from a product. It's a really difficult and fraught space to be in, particularly if you're a person that is a transgender person and you're going through a transition. Because what may, might happen is you go up to that, that conveyor belt where you go to pay for your item, and there's a whole series of social 
social things that happen when somebody looks at a product that you want to use, and they make a judgment on whether you should be using it or not. And I feel like this really does connect with the digital services and the, and the products that we create. It's the same sense of, should I be using this? Is this for me? Have they included me? Am I represented in any small way so that I can feel comfortable using this? And it really does make all the difference for people that are trans, non-binary, somewhere, somewhere on that spectrum. And one of the things that I like to try and remember is how to make something usable, relevant, and simple for anyone to use. Anyone. Uh, one of the greatest things about doing this talk quite a few times is I get various people coming up to me afterwards and saying, oh, I've been making this product, and I really want to know how, I, how to make it better. And so one of the most specific examples that I can give around this idea of inclu including somebody within or including diversity within a digital product, is I had somebody ask me about a fitness app that they were creating. And they were like, so we've got these, these figures that people choose, and there's one that does this, right, the in and out bit, and then we've got one that's this. And this is woman, and this is man. And I was like, hmm, yeah, that's, that's tricky, that's tricky. Because what if you're neither? What if you're going from one to the other? What if you're a a woman, but you don't do this. Not all women do this. <laughs> Not all men do this. How do you include people within those kinds of products? And I said, well, simply, do, do you need to have these, these different shapes? Or can there be options? There, are, there is a, a great way to just include people self-describing their own names, pronouns, and you, this can extend to things like body shape. So you don't need to stick with the, if you need to visually represent people within iconography or within, within visual mediums for things like this. Um, so um, connected to UX and the experience and how people that aren't necessarily well represented within these medium uh, are, uh, I'm going to go through, I, I basically, whenever I'm on the internet doing various things like a normal person, I will screenshot pretty much every form that I have to fill in. And this is now a series of slides of good things and bad things. And this is, um, this is actually from a company that I used to work for called Unite Students. They are a student accommodation service. And one of the things that they asked in their accommodation uh, form was they asked for your gender. And I was like, I wonder why. Um, and also, not specified is really an odd term to use. And I found out that actually, by not specifying, um, you, don't, you don't share your gender with your potential flatmates. But also, you might get put in any of those kinds of Flatmates. So you might end up in a flat with all men, you might end up in a flat with all women, and it, it basically collected data which didn't necessarily inform the decision that the, the system needed to be informed by. So I, I went into the dev team and I said, C can, we, can we change this? Do we really need to include this? Can we just ask people whether they want to live with men or live with women? And I had this really deep and involved conversation which was very confusing, which eventually got down to the, the real issue, which was the reason that we wanted to make sure that we put women with women and men with men was because the impression that was, that was there was that if you had men and women together, that they would have sex. Um, and then I remember thinking, ah, okay, so that's why you've got the option, okay. And I was like, but, but I've got another question for you do you realize that sometimes men have sex with men? And sometimes women have sex with women. And sometimes people have sex with people. And they were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so bizarre. <laughs> They've actually got a lot better at this now. They actually included all the changes. So I'm really pleased. Um, so I'm going to whiz through some of, these, some of these best practices or some of these things which you may want to consider including in your your forums. One of the things that most trans people and non-binary people absolutely dread 
is this idea of a real name. Um, please, if I can give you any kind of advice, don't refer to a legal name as a real name and a preferred name or their name as not their real name. Um, so as you go through a transition, you go through the process of having to get lots of document, documents changed. And one of the best things that you can do is have different options for, say, your, the name that you go by or your preferred name. And if you do need to collect the legal name, you can ask for the legal name or the name as it is on their passport or their identification. But what I end up having to do a lot of the time is that just asks me for my full name with a matching ID. And I'm like, oh gosh, now I've got to do this big, long explanation in this tiny text box about this is my preferred name, but my legal name is da 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 da. So just give them the extra options to, to inform you about all these different things. It's, it's, it's only a couple of extra form fields on your form. One of the other things is around using titles. If you still use titles, which isn't necessary in, in products nowadays, but if you still need to collect them for whatever reason you might, include uh, different options. So the MX title, which is the gender neutral title, which is now widely accepted by the government in the UK. It's a good idea to add them. Otherwise, you get messages from people like me saying things like this, that I want to close the account and registering a new email, and please add this. Um, this is good feedback as well. Obviously, this, this kind of feedback informs your changes within your products. But yeah, always good to add the option in. This also goes true for things like pronouns. And um, with most recent passport changes, where there's an X gender marker, which is just coming in in a lot of different countries. And the thing about pronouns is there are some standard ones that many people use. There's she, there's he, there's they. They is always a good one to go with as well and include as, as a diverse option. But just bear in mind that there are so many different ways that people outside the gender binary can use pronouns. There's things like Z, Zir, uh, Fay, uh, lots of different ones. So ethnicity is a really tricky one as well. There's a great article by one of my friends, Sarai, uh, around how using radio buttons to uh, choose your ethnicity is, is limiting, and you might be multiple different ethnicities. So adding checkboxes in is a good thing. And this, um, this is an example of maybe too many options where you could have just had a, a free text field. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about the prefer not to say in the none of your business. I would really prefer to say I spent Bet the better part of my life being closeted in both my gender identity and my sexuality. Now that I'm comfortable and happy and proud to be telling people my, both of those things, my gender identity and my sexuality, I would really prefer to say, please, please give me an option to say, I really want to tell you. So these are some, some good examples. So here we've got at the bottom, we've got an option for somebody's included mix. We've got a, one down here where they've given me a free text field. They've also asked me that I prefer to be known as name. We've also got this tricky, um, this tricky aspect of if you need to know what gender or sex was assigned at birth. There are compassionate ways where you can ask that in forms. So you can ask at birth you were described as uh, and then you can also ask things like, do you identify as the gender that you were assigned at birth? And also, would you like to say anything else about that? Most of the time, people do. So typically, a lot of these conversations are really tricky because they skirt around this, this issue of what we call edge cases. And I very much take the opinion that the term edge cases is typically used early on in product development to discourage people like designers and developers and product creators from really including the people that need our help most within those product discussions. Most of the time in my career, the term edge case is thrown in just to kind of boot it to the side and focus on the primary audience. But really, the people that we should be including and considering the most, the people that are most affected by these kinds of passovers in, in form fields, 
are the, are the most important, are the ones that are in, under, under stress and danger, really. So I like to call them stress cases, and I like to use the term the people that need our empathy and attention the most, because when you include those people, it really makes a difference for them. And if you need statistics, because often companies tend to need statistics to back up some of these ethical and empathetic decisions, then you can look at the different information from the US National Center for Transgender Equality and quotes from Stonewall, a charity based in the UK which looks at LGBTQ plus rights. So, so many people um, identify as non-binary non and genderqueer nowadays, young people especially. And if you need more reasons in how you, what, and how and why you should be including these kinds of people within the small interventions you can make in your form fields, all you have to do really is take to Twitter and, and see the kinds of, the kinds of uh, stress that these people really take on on a daily basis, dismissing who they are, uh, the journey that they're taking, and um, it's really important that even in small ways, we can make their experiences that much more comfortable, that much more inclusive, that hopefully we can move towards a place where the LGBT plus community and people that are marginalized are not receiving hate crime threats and abuse online. And these small ways where you can change form fields really do make a difference here, it helps them feel included. So um, I've got a kind of statement slide here. So a lot of people do like to take a picture of this one, obviously no obligation. But I feel that as designers, we are at the forefront of how products serve users, but also how the digital and physical world represents and reflects back at us. And that we have a responsibility to be inclusive, sensitive, and understanding with what we design and endeavor to help the people that aren't marginalized, the people that are well represented, foster their understanding and acceptance and expose them to systems that include rather than exclude. I'll just leave that up there for a second. So this is really about that choice to take on that responsibility to help people on this journey. Whether or not you're part of a marginalized group or not, you have to make that choice about how involved you want to be within this conversation, how much of an ally and advocate you need, you need and want to be. So I'm not always fantastic. There are definitely gaps in my knowledge. And this is where I look to my community to help me. I look to my workmates that are based in East Africa, and I look to the communities that I try and involve myself in to learn more. So I give myself a C plus most of the time, sometimes a B if I'm feeling particularly nice. But what I would say is there's a series of things that you can do if you are not marginalized or there are parts of the marginalized community that you want to get to know better. So one of the things that I do is I go out to as many events and meetups as I possibly can, and I reach out to people in communities to ask questions and get involved. So what you can do is ask other people when it's safe and encouraged to do so and practice compassion. So that's one of the reasons why I say at the beginning of my talks that you can come and ask questions. This is a, a safe space to ask those kind of questions which you feel nervous about. Talk about these issues with not just your marginalized people, and communities and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So it isn't always the responsibility of the people who are marginalized to do the education. And question your words and assumptions and think about why you say these and where these come from. So why are you using the term guys to address a room? Is it because you know that all of those people do identify as guys? Or maybe, just maybe, there's a person in that room that's actually thinking about transitioning at this very moment, and by referring to them as guys, that's kind of you know, adding to that very, that, that death by a thousand cuts. 
And one of the things that I struggle with the most around my words is not using ableist language, not using words like, that's crazy, or that's insane, or those kinds of things that we use to describe typically messy systems. There are ways which you can, you can gear your language to be more inclusive. And for those that can go a little bit further, I would always advocate that you volunteer for or sponsor different events. So local prides and LGBTQ plus organizations, groups that support people with disabilities or impairments, and groups and organizations that promote people of color in technology. And uh, as always, I always like to finish with a comprehensive reading list. I'm a big reader myself. So these are some books, magazines, and different web links that I would really recommend that you take a read. There's one specifically on pronoun tips for binary men and women. There's a great podcast which talks about gen gender inequality and different inequalities within uh, geeky industries and tech. Um, and yeah, there's some, some fantastic information out there from the Human Rights uh, Quality Commission uh, on these issues. So um, I think, how much, how much time have I got? I'm done. Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, this is the final slide. If you have questions, I think there'll be time afterwards. Oh, there's time now. Nice. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>my point across. Mm -hmm. So in such scenarios, would you continue to have such awkward conversations and, I don't know, try to hopefully educate someone or not yeah. really educate, but try to show that they are different points of views or do you just let it go? Mm. Yeah, this is a tricky one. So typically, typically marginalized people have, as, when they feel comfortable, in their identity. They typically then enter a space where they really do want to do that education piece and they really want to engage. What I would always say is when you are taking on that, that work, because it is work, it's uh, what we call um, uh, emotional, emotional labor. You're doing emotional labor for another person, which is work. When, as much as you can in the moment, take stock of how you're feeling because what's most important is your safety and your comfort within these situations, right? And even by engaging in these conversations, even in a small way, you are what we, what we like to call, is you're planting some seeds. And sometimes the seeds will be watered and, and grow really quickly. Sometimes they'll take a really long time. They need the right conditions to grow. They might need somebody else coming in and watering them every now and then. It might need a little bit more sunlight. They might need a little bit more time. Somebody else might come in and plant some more seeds 
around yours, and there might be something that happens there. And I think that's one of the things that took me a really long time to understand, like, how much impact can I make, and how much do I need to look after myself? So as much as you can within those situations, like, and sometimes the hardest part is when you're maybe in a meeting uh, or in a social situation, and you feel like the best way that you, the, the way that you should be doing things is to respond right away. It's 100% okay to not tackle that right away. Take stock of yourself and your energy levels before you, you engage in those, those conversations. But I think it's very admirable and important to recognize that you, you started that conversation and it might go somewhere. And again, another difficult thing is not necessarily knowing whether something good will happen with that. It's sometimes a little bit difficult, I, I know I found it difficult, to have conversations and then walk away from either the organization, the company, or the people, and never know whether they actually do any further work to, to become better. I think that's sometimes the most difficult thing, is you're not quite sure whether you've set them on the right path or not, or a path of better understanding. But I think that there is, a, there is a victory there. There's a victory around having and starting the conversation and planting those seeds. But it's not always, it's not always easy at all. And sometimes you have to have the same conversations over and over again with the same people, slightly different. There's no magic perfect wording to help people understand. And even in families, you know, even in people that you know the best and you're closest to, it's still really tough. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Okay. I apologize for my English, which is not really good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I, I did work on a website uh, before, and I remember you put a screen with the ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So at first, the website we put, uh, we need to know the ethnicity of the person because it was a medical form mm -hmm. for doctors. And we put Caucasian. Uh, the problem we got is that people, they didn't know the meaning of Caucasian, so mm. they will check others. <laughs> so we need to put, you know, white people, mm -hmm. which, which we feel was wrong, but you know, we didn't have the right information in, in fact. So mm -hmm. what is your, you know, uh, 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 what, what you, you will doing in that case? Yeah, this is, this is um, a question which asks, actually, it's a specific question, but it opens up a larger conversation around users and how they self-describe and how a system interprets that and whether it interprets it correctly give for the given needs of the data. This is something which isn't fully solved yet because users are really, uh, and people, users slash people are very, um, yeah, they have their own ideas. They're what we sometimes call like messy or, you know, one person's perception of, of gender or, or ethnicity here can be completely different over here. So one thing I advocate a lot for is free text fields. But unless free text fields are able to intelligently interpret things like typos or very new things, like some people, some people can create their own pronouns a lot of the time. What I would say is the I've seen the term white, white, white British, white, white nation, which, whichever nationality afterwards, used quite a lot. And what I would say is that as long as you're giving the option for um, another, or I, I would sometimes want to move away from the term other. Um, I'm not sure about ethnicity, how othering works within ethnicity, but I know that othering within gender can be very harmful, so it's always like a good option to do self-describe, or how would you describe, ask, ask a question. Um, and if that system can intelligently pick up, say, white and then British, or white, 
Canadian, white American, then hopefully it can parse that information a little bit more compassionately. But yeah, I think asking your users is, again, if you've got a good user testing and usability team, then I would. There are also tools that I can maybe recommend to do those kinds of testing. OK. All right, everyone. Uh, so we'd like to thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you.